Um, thank you very much. Uh, and firstly, uh, I'd like to thank um, Kelly, Elise, and Francisco for the very kind invitation um, to come here th uh, this morning. Uh, and other than being told that I would wake up at 1.30 in the morning, which I actually did, um, we're very grateful to be here uh, in Toronto uh, to meet old friends and to meet new colleagues and make new friends. Um, so Dublin is quite well, Ireland is quite well known for a number of things. Um, on the top left are the Cliffs of Moher, so it's one of our natural beauty spots. Uh, Oscar Wilde amongst other uh, literary giants of Irish literature. Uh, the Georgian Doors of Dublin, which I hope Kelly got some time to visit during her hard project and hard time that she spent. And then obviously Guinness's uh, social history of Ireland and Kelly's haunt for most of her lunch breaks during her time with us uh, in the last um, summer. But in being asked seriously to come and talk uh, about rehabilitation, I, I was quite taken by the tagline of Quaker's meeting, looking back and looking forward, and we don't have a rehabilitation programme. Uh, we don't have a formal integrated research platform. Um, we had a point two of a physiotherapy session back in the early 90s, talking to Stephanie last night, uh, uh, which was primarily related to HIV-related admissions at the time when there wasn't obviously therapeutic interventions available. Uh, and then that service was lost as it was integrated back into the clinical services. Um, so I, I think the meeting, I'm very much looking forward to the next two days to perhaps reflecting back on where we are, what we've come from and then looking at what we might need to disinvest in to reinvest in a changing environment. Um, so I was given the uh, inevitable task in 20 minutes to cover three main topics, HIV infection uh, in Ireland, HIV service delivery as it stands presently in the country, and then finally to finish on HIV related research and how then it might feed into the talks that are going to follow. So I think for those of you that have not been to Ireland, <coughs> HIV is really a social journey like it has been in a lot of other countries and jurisdictions. In 1987, excuse me, 25 years ago, um, the first uh, consultant physician to hospital practice was appointed in the Irish system. Prior to that, there was no um, appointed system for sexual health service delivery. And at the time of Fiona Mulcahy's appointment, she returned from the UK as a GU physician. There were almost 9,000 STI attendances. HIV was identified, obviously, as a significant issue both nationally and internationally but interesting in a social context where homosexuality was illegal where condoms were not widely available and where there was no sex education within our secondary or primary schools so in looking at where HIV was then in the 80s when Fiona returned, um, obviously she was a single-handed physician uh, bringing HIV and sexual health to uh, the forefront in a society where perhaps both sexuality uh, and concern around HIV care delivery were both uh, pertinent. Um, treatment was not available, obviously, and at the time, though we had a designated inpatient ward, the facility was primarily for looking after patients with symptomatic HIV-related illnesses. A decade later, when I returned from the US, I had trained in Boston uh, as my ID training, uh, we had approximately 800 patients attending the unit. Uh, and at that time, just over half of our patients had acquired their disease through injection drug use. We, a third of our patients had acquired disease sexually through um, uh, uh, sexual contact. And we uh, housed the National Centre for Hereditary Coagulation Diseases, so all the National Haemophilia Cohort attends our department in St. James's, uh, given that the hospital uh, campus co-locates both services. Interestingly, at that time, um, we uh, had, as I said, the majority of patients had acquired disease through drug use, and just the other three pictorials are to give an idea about socioeconomic background of these patients. So on the bottom left is the unemployment status, so almost 80% of these people were unemployed. On the top right is educational history, taken from a cohort of 130 drug users. And primary school education ends at the age of 12. Uh, junior search education is at the age of 15 and leaving search education is the age of uh, 17 or 18. So only 10% of our patients at that time had acquired uh, an education to the age of 17. And then in the last pictorial on the bottom right is uh, issues relating to um, social deprivation, I suppose, and socioeconomic uh, challenges and the age of incarceration of our patients, that the majority of patients who have been incarcerated had uh, had their first prison exposure uh, under the age of 15.
And then the boon came. So for those of you, I think you need to have had your head in the sand not to realise what Ireland has come through in the last decade. We had a significant economic boom for uh, eight years and we are now in a significant economic decline. But as a consequence of the Celtic Tiger, three things drove the epidemic for HFE. So one was a change in sexual health practices. The other was migration and setting of economic uh, success. And then finally, obviously, issues pertaining to HFE care delivery itself, pertaining to the availability of successful treatments. So this is not the slide that Board Vulture want me to show when we're saying, please come to Dublin. But this is a pictorial of the largest reported outbreak of syphilis uh, in Europe. And this was in 2004. So on the top left are the news stories relating to Dublin as the capital of STDs of Europe, um, being hit by a sex bug outbreak. And just at the bottom is the tagline of a um, report on a mutant syphilis uh, relating to the documentation of a cytromycin resistant uh, disease in work that we had undertaken with Sheila Lucard's group in, universe, in uh, Washington. But what the pictorial is showing, obviously, is that whilst there were reported cases of early primary and secondary syphilis and MSMs in other European cities, we had almost 800 cases in Dublin. And the majority of those cases were primary or secondary, so very infectious from the point of the non-clinicians in, in the audience. 90% um, were amongst men who have sex with men, and worryingly, 20% were known to be co-infected with HIV at the time. Uh, and one of the real concerns from this outbreak was the lack of subsequent follow-up and the lack of subsequent engagement in retesting post-standard window period um, time points. Um, then the second driver to the HIV epidemic in the last decade was immigration. So there were probably three things that drove immigration into the Irish society. One was obviously political drivers for people leaving their country uh, in the first place. The second issue related to the economic success of Ireland and the opportunities that Ireland was now providing, uh, we would have been those people three generations ago. The Irish were the people coming to New York, coming to America, coming to Canada, uh, going to New Zealand and Australia. Um, and thirdly, we have this anomaly in legal terms where people who delivered a baby in the Irish Republic were entitled for that child to have um, Irish citizenship. That then afforded them EU citizenship, and then that afforded the parents EU citizenship. And some of that were anomaly related to the political issues of the country, Northern Ireland and the Republic. And f it wasn't until 2006 that that actually got addressed. Rest. Um, but the graph on the right is showing just this, these are St. James's figures, our own unit, sorry, and what they're just highlighting is that between 2000 and 2003, almost 50% of all our new cases occurred uh, in people who had migrated to the Irish um, country. So, and 10 years later, our cohort now rising to about 3,000. The demography had obviously shifted, so drug use accounted for only 30% of our cohort, 40% uh, of the cohort were now had acquired disease through heterosexual contact, and uh, MSMs accounted for 30% uh, of the national cohort group. <coughs> In the last week, the Health Protection Surveillance Centre have published data um, on HIV in Ireland to the end of 2012. Uh, on the left is the pictorial of the crude prevalence rate excuse me, of HIV in the country. It's 7.4 per 100,000 in the setting of a European average of 5.7, but there is obviously wide variation across Europe. On the top right is the breakdown by risk group, and our single biggest concern is the rise amongst MSMs, which represent the single biggest group for HIV acquisition for the last four years running. And then in the bottom right are identifying the benefits of therapy pertaining to the number of AIDS reported cases and the number of deaths amongst our cohort. So in summary, for 2012, we had 340 new cases. The highest number of new cases were at MSMs, which accounted for almost 50% of the cohort, drug use 4%, and heterosexual acquisition for 38%. There were no cases of mother-to-child transmission in 2012 amongst 97 pregnancies. Concerning for us, almost 50% of people are still presenting late, CD4 counts less than 350, uh, with a quarter of our patients having a CD4 count less than 200. And there was some discrepancy between drug users, MSMs, and heterosexuals amongst that uh, percentage. Um, 33 reported AIDS events occurred in newly diagnosed patients, and again there was a breakdown between heterosexual MSM and IGU risk acquisition, and almost 1 in 10 patients were over 50 years of age at time of diagnosis.
So this is just a schematic that you all work with. This is at a population health level, how best to address uh, sexual health and education and prevention. So the overall issue is around education and sexual health. And Ireland, whilst it has moved a long way in the last decade, has still a long journey to go pertaining to the openness uh, and availability of uh, sexual health education issues around sexuality, issues around sexual health services. There are very few even medical uh, services. Um, but to move forward from that, um, that's really been part of a national uh, strategy. Uh, below that, we have people who are in high risk, obviously pertaining to uh, intervention requirements. Uh, we have people who are HIV positive who have unknown status. We're trying to move towards a universal testing program, and I'll show you why in the coming slides. Uh, and then we still have a, a cohort of patients who we fail to retain in care, who despite diagnosis are presenting to intensive care units, um, are uh, presenting to other hospitals, and then getting transferred with opportunistic infections relating to their diagnosis. With regards to those that are in care, obviously we have done very well. On the bottom left is an added pictorial relation to a review of 3,500 patients who access outpatient care in Ireland. Uh, this was undertaken in 2010, um, a huge undertaking by one of our uh, senior fellows who uh, basically reviewed every single patient attending every single centre in the country, um, from which we were able to report 80% of patients were on antiretroviral therapies, and of those patients, almost 90% had an undetectable viral load. Like every other jurisdiction, we still have a cohort of people unaware of diagnosis. And one of the issues around diagnosis is obviously testing. So if you don't test, you're not going to know the diagnosis. So um, this is a um, report from an online survey for men who have sex with men uh, who were syphilis positive. And the only thing that I, I want to reference is the fact that if I don't move the slides with this, which I will. Um, I don't have a pointer, but the only thing that I wanted to point out was that within the Republic of Ireland, which is ROI, 37% uh, of uh, men who had syphilis had never had a HIV test at any point in their history. 43% um, in the uh, Northern Ireland and 38% in the country in its totality. And that got even worse when you looked at where people lived. So for those of you that have I should probably should have asked who's been to Ireland, but those of you that have not been to Ireland, um, the 30% of our population live in Dublin. That's our capital. It's on the east coast. And the remainder um, of the population live primarily between two large metropolitan cities, Galway and Cork, and then, obviously, um, the other 26 counties in the Republic. Uh, and interestingly, this data identified that depending on where you were located in your area of residence, it impacted, obviously, on your availability or engagement in testing. So as people lived in smaller rural areas, they were even less likely to have ever undergone a HIV uh, test. Um, from 2012's report, this is just a pictorial that identifies the changing demography amongst the heterosexual population. So we have a reduction in migration as a consequence of both our economy, economic decline, um, but also as a consequence of a change in the legislation in 2006 pertaining to um, uh, access to our citizenship. Um, I should say that in the time period of the last decade when people entered the Irish healthcare system, there was no um, proactive um, evaluation of delayed entrance into the Irish system. There was opportunistic screening, which is a very pejorative term, but it was opportunistic and provided, um, but it wasn't a holistic uh, opportunity to provide people from other jurisdictions an opportunity to avail of their health evaluation. And the only form of HIV testing was in our antenatal voluntary screening. So in 1997, the government introduced voluntary screening for HIV for all public hospitals providing maternity care. Uh, uptake has been about 99%. So most of our heterosexual cases were actually opportunistically diagnosed through women presenting to antenatal care. So we have still a cohort of men and women who have not conceived in the last decade who have migrated to Ireland and have not had their HIV test taken to date. And then finally, um, it will be important to reference um, the people for whom socioeconomic recovery uh, did not really afford them any uh, societal uh, benefit. And that's our, our patients who have acquired disease through drug use. And while some of this is now representative by people migrating from Eastern Europe, in previous years it was primarily people who had acquired, uh, Irish people who had acquired HIV uh, as a consequence of substance use locally. Uh, and this is uh, just a pictorial of situations for uh, people who have acquired disease through drug use in the setting of a review of 2010 
again, where we looked at almost 1,800 missed clinic appointments. 87% of them were accounted by people who had acquired disease by drug use. And in people who had more than two hospital admissions, almost three quarters were people who had had a history of injection drug use. And in the last years, we've developed a programme of outreach where Saloni is now uh, providing care for uh, HIV within the drug treatment uh, programmes and drug treatment clinics. So that's the whistle stop tour of HIV in 30 years in hopefully 13 minutes. So uh, the second part of the talk is really to look at service delivery. And this is, I suppose, um, critical in the setting of how best to uh, address some of the challenges I've identified in the national data. So um, this is Ireland. Uh, as I said, to the right is Dublin. Um, in Dublin, there are three hospitals providing HIV care. Um, there's our own unit in St. James's Hospital. Our cohort is just over 2,000. Uh, the Matter Hospital, uh, Paddy runs a research programme there, but with two other clinical colleagues, uh, and Sam in Beaumont, looking after a quarter of 350 patients. And then there are three other public uh, centres, uh, one in Galway on the west coast, uh, Limerick, uh, and uh, the final uh, centre in Cork. Um, and these are public hospital service providers. There are, amongst this cohort um, of physicians, uh, we're all full-time clinicians, nobody has protected academic time, uh, and we're also internal medicine physicians and ID physicians, so that's my moan over with. Um, but amongst the public hospital providers, there are three people who also provide private practice. So there is a cohort of patients who are captured within the national data who are acquire their care or uh, access their care uh, through private practice. So um, this is PATCHU1, the acronym for work that Helen led uh, in 2010, and PATCHU2 is uh, going to start uh, this year. And essentially it was a review of just over 3,000 patients in Ireland who are accessing care in outpatients. So it doesn't capture everybody who's HIV positive. By definition, it was just those patients who had had more than two outpatient visits in the previous nine months. 80% uh, of the cohort are Dublin-based, 25% over the age of 45, a third of the patients are African, and a relatively low rate of drug-related re resistant transmission. Uh, as I've referenced, 80% of people on antiretroviral therapy, of whom 90% uh, are virologically suppressed. This was in 2010. So um, from a demographic breakdown of that cohort, the two things to identify, I suppose, relevant to this um, particular presentation are that a quarter of our patients are over 45. I still think that's very young. I'm getting increasingly concerned about the age that um, old age has been referred to, but 25% um, are over 45. And on the right is the pictorial, just breaking down country of origin with risk. So obviously for our injection drug users, most of those are Irish. For our heterosexual females, 72% of them are um, women. Finally, then, we looked at um, the access to antiretroviral therapy according to CT4 count. And there are essentially, of the total Irish cohort access and care, 130 patients who have a CT4 count below, 100, sorry, below 350 who are not presently on antiretroviral therapy as of the time of this review in 2010. And what we're trying to do is explore what might be the reasons behind that. Was it gender? Was it ethnicity? Was it location of care? Uh, or was it uh, risk group related? More recently, um, the country has undertaken a um, census, uh, and we have been able now for the first time to report crude rates of HIV by county. Uh, and this now is a driver towards us introducing expanded testing in the Dublin area, in that we now know that there are the, the crude rate is uh, 2 per 1,000 of the population, and no more than in the US and in the UK, uh, this becomes the driver for which we can then hopefully argue for the cost effectiveness behind at least increased targeted, if not universal, testing. Um, in the north side of the city, Paddy has been leading on a collaboration with the Bronx, uh, where they have been doing rapid testing and risk behaviour assessment in all emergency uh, attendances. They've looked after 3,000 subjects to date, uh, and their diagnosis rate of new cases has matched the actual region prevalence. So they have picked up two new cases in the first 1,000 people screened.
Finally, um, in talking to Greg earlier on, I think in reflecting about what we need, uh, particularly pertinent to this presentation, uh, to do to establish a formal rehabilitation program and a social adaptation program, we may need to look at disinfesting and some of the things that we've been doing historically for the last 20 years that may no longer be necessarily meaningful. One of the things that we will need to explore is the expenditure on antiretroviral therapy, and this is just from our own department. We're presently spending 24 million euro um, on a quick guesstimate, I think that's 30 million Canadian dollars, I think. Um, we dispense drugs in our department, so it's slightly different when I worked in the US, patients would have got a prescription, they would have gone out to the pharmacy and got their meds. We have an in-house pharmacy um, within our department. We dispense all drugs, both to inpatients and outpatients, and the drugs budget comes from our department. So it may provide some opportunity with commissioning of services coming forward where we can look at this expenditure and perhaps use some of that funding uh, to invest in a uh, service requirement for the patient cohort. So as I've said, direct costs uh, relating to drugs, diagnostics, infrastructure and inpatient care, uh, and hopefully then to offset that uh, as we look at societal and presenteeism in its broader term for the ageing population. Um, our focus nationally is to partner with colleagues. The an acronym at the bottom is missing, but these are just national bodies and groups, including obviously the people who come to see us in an attempt to improve issues relating to access, decrease HIV-related health disparities, and then to obviously decrease HIV-related incidents going forward. The hospital itself, so this is where Kelly came to work with us uh, last summer, um, is in the inner city part of Dublin. Um, it was established in 1971. It's the largest hospital, 1,000 beds, 4,500 staff. Uh, and this looks fantastic because it's the modern part of the hospital. And we were just, I was reflecting when you were mentioning the emergency room across the way, Francisco, because this is not where we are housed. Uh, we're in the very corner of the campus in the oldest part of the service. But there are some merits to that. We have autonomy, we have our own ward, we have our own capacity to manage, we have our own capacity to look at patient flow and processes. Uh, we run 14 parallel clinics in five days. There is no way we could do any of that if we were in the main frame of the hospital going through patient processing and flow in a, a general ambulatory care program. So there are pluses and minuses to being uh, in the old part of the hospital. So this is our department. We're a joint service between GU Medicine, which is genital urinary medicine, and infectious diseases. And we uh, um, became the guide clinic in 2000 when I returned from the US. Uh, when I came home, we had all these great plans to build uh, a new service um, on the top left uh, and just in the middle on the right was going to try and reconfigure the old uh, building in an attempt to make it even then uh, more patient-friendly and more user-friendly for the services that we provided. The bottom two photographs are courtesy of Dr. O'Brien. Uh, the blue sky is a myth. I'm not sure which of her days she was in Dublin when she had blue sky because it <laughs> rained consistently for the whole time that Kelly was with us. Um, but the bottom is the outside building and the bottom right then just as our uh, access point for clinic. The, the unique thing, however, that I have been reflecting and talking to Stephanie last night and to Patty is that right beside this building, we're about to build a 50 million euro uh, funded by the American Philanthropy Group uh, Centre or Institute for Successful Aging. And it is primarily, obviously, driven by the gerontologists. They have been working 25 years to get to this point, and the architects are in. They're about to demolish half of our building, which is, again, a good opportunity. Um, and it may be through that virtual initially and then actual fiscal integration that perhaps some of the things that I've been hearing about in the last 24 hours uh, may develop for us. Uh, relating to the service, um, about 10% of our patients are diagnosed uh, at an age greater than 50, and as of this month, 18% uh, of 2,000 patients are over the age of 50. So this is just one slide uh, pertaining to ageing. I'm not a gerontologist, I'm not a an expert in rehabilitation medicine, but in talking to our gerontologists, they would advise us that successful aging relates to these five issues, exercise, smoking, moderate alcohol consumption, healthy diet and socialization, none of which our patients have. 50% of our patients smoke. Most of our patients, like a lot of Irish, unfortunately consume too much alcohol. Very few people have healthy lifestyles pertaining to exercise or diet. And socialization is probably the critical issue. Most of our patients are already marginalized as a consequence of either sexuality, migration, or relating to injection drug use. And the pictorial on the right is just looking at deprivation index around the hospital, identifying the high deprivation index in the area in which the hospital is housed. 
Uh, and this is work that's mapping actually what Michelle Obama did in Chicago, where she looked at uh, community-based asset mapping and looked at ways in which you look at disparity in health outcomes associated with the areas in which people uh, resided. So we have a lot of work to do to get to any point of getting to zero, but our critical issues are around enhanced testing. If we don't test more, we're missing cases, retention in care, equity of access, and then like everybody else, uh, local uh, behavioral intervention measures and immunological interventions. So in summing up, uh, I'm going to move towards HIV-related uh, research, and I think this probably will feed into the talks that are, are going to come next. So. HIV research in Ireland, as I've said, is clinician delivered. Um, the five of us or six of us who are appointed to services are fundamentally clinicians. We are full-time clinical practice. There's not uh, as yet an academic chair or academic position, but that may obviously change as we articulate the argument. Um, we have a HIV clinical therapeutic trials group that Siobhan is director of, uh, and then we do research almost siloed in areas of interest. So HIV and cardiovascular disease, HIV and bone health, HIV and renal disease, and then HIV and cognitive function. But perhaps uh, the opportunity will afford itself for us to become more integrated in our research approach. So very briefly, just one or two slides on, on just to give a sample. So this is some cardiovascular work that uh, one of our fellows, Ashley Loy, presented at Washington last summer, uh, looking at the role of gadolinium screening in um, asymptomatic HIV-positive men and identifying a pickup rate of asymptomatic myocardial infarction and undiagnosed myocarditis. One of the interesting things, however, from that small project was that when we went back then six months later and looked at those same men, there was a significant benefit to actually having engaged in the study itself. So that even if you had a normal cardiovascular evaluation, the fact that you participated in the study, and we were just discussing last night with Rosin this whole issue about engagement in studies, and we have to say we're very fortunate in that most of our patient group are actually wanting to engage in studies. There's not an incentive required. They want to participate in clinical outcome and, and better care for themselves, but also for the service delivery. Um, so improvement in alcohol intake, exercise, and dietary measures. Um, Paddy in the north side, uh, in collaboration with her own unit, has been looking at uh, bone health in the last year, uh, and this is work just presented at Croy this February on the largest prospective controlled study in bone, uh, identifying clearly that HIV had an independent risk for low BMD uh, measured at the femoral head and lumbar spine. We have a clinical vaccine group, which we established in 2000, which has served uh, within our department. We provide vaccinations because primary care was not doing so. Uh, and this has provided an infrastructure for patients to access influenza, pneumococcal vaccine, varicella vaccine, travel vaccines for our African populations returning to their family and friends, uh, and also more recently looking at HPV vaccination. We have looked at some novel measures to improve hep B vaccine outcomes. Our reporters' vaccination response rates are about 85% with use of double-dose vaccine and SMS texting to improve adherence and outcome. And then we have uniquely in Ireland a cohort of about 18% of zero negative VZV status in our patients who have migrated from other temperate climates. And this is a concern in the setting of both HIV but of the general group itself. Um, and we have been working with the HPSC to to introduce that. Pneumococcal disease, we've been looking at uh, vaccination with conjugate vaccine on a boost prime approach in the setting of immunosuppression and response. And then more recently for HPV, we don't have a national program for HPV vaccination. We're vaccinating young girls, but not vaccinating young boys, and we're not presently vaccinating uh, MSMs, which we're moving to do. In hepatitis C, we have a large program looking at clinical care delivery, individualization of treatment, and clinical translational care from hepatitis C over the last 10 years. Uh, we have access to liver transplantation, though in the UK, so we have to refer our patients who require liver transplant to uh, King's Hospital, and in the last three years have transplanted five patients. And then more recently, we've been funded from Europe to look at a hep C vaccine in HIV positive uh, patients with partners in Oxford and Switzerland. So, uh, finally, to sum up, because I know I'm coming to over time, um, this is the more important part. I've kept the most important work till the end. Uh, and as I said, we don't have a, a formal cognitive screening clinic. We don't have a formal rehabilitation program. We don't have a patient advocacy, actually, when I think about it and what has been discussed already this morning, um, that would push this agenda forward for us. But as I said, the next two days obviously give uh, us time to reflect on that. 
We do, however, have a need. So uh, we did a retrospective review of 500 charts in our clinic, uh, looking by surrogate markers of the rate of cognitive impairment, and clearly from that identified that there was a need to actually prospectively introduce the programme. So in 2011, with the research fellow in partners in neuropsychology and in neurology, uh, Patricia McNamara has started work on her PhD looking at the inflammatory uh, degenerative continuum of HIV-related cognitive impairment uh, on questioning whether this was an inflammatory process early on in the disease leading to subsequent neurodegeneration. And for the purpose of the presentation, just two things to show. Firstly is the prevalence study. So we've uh, recruited 600 patients, uh, a positive screen in 51%. And one of the things that's a real challenge for us now is that Patricia finishes her PhD in the next three months, and we have no clinical infrastructure to find and recruit and surveil those uh, 300 patients who've had a positive screen on their cognitive function assessment. So that's a, a target for us in the coming uh, two to three months. Uh, within the cohort, the uh, province issues identified female, gender, country of birth and English language. Um, and whilst we've identified risk factors, um, the real issue was what we were going to be able to do uh, in the setting of having identified a need uh, and how best to follow those patients going forward. We have looked at 95 patients uh, with a detailed neuropsychological study and again identified uh, gender uh, language excuse me, uh, as critical issues pertaining to the uh, outcomes of same. 60% uh, of people on the neuropsychological uh, review had met the criteria for diagnosis of hand and I've given the subgroups uh, in the left side. Uh, only 11% had an entirely normal testing which is interesting the setting of the sensitivity of brief cognitive screening assays. And interestingly, almost a third of patients had an abnormality in only one domain. So whilst they wouldn't make the definition of hand, they obviously had early dysfunction. We've identified that there is obviously significant functional impairment. And while some people do not meet the criteria for hand presently, the concern is obviously will this evolve uh, prospectively uh, and for whom surveillance is going to be required. So for us, our longitudinal follow-up is going to be required. How are we going to see these people? We've just published uh, this year on limitations to identification of the condition and to its management, uh, and, and obviously are very much guided by the recent work that Simon and Sean have been involved in in the Mild Exchange Programme, just published in CID. All of our work is facilitated through the new uh, Welcome Trust HRB Clinical Research Facility. So this is uh, where I now have a part appointment, uh, and it looks like a brand new building because it is, and it's right beside our old building, but it is the facility under which we're hopefully then going to be able to transition our research programme to. So like all good talks, I've left the best to, to end. So this is the work that uh, Kelly uh, is going to present tomorrow. We were really very fortunate to meet a good friend and colleague last summer. Uh, we had a great time and really it has highlighted, I think, a, a, an issue that perhaps we were seeing in silos and perhaps not seeing it all integrated together. So our hope is that this then becomes a focus for work to, uh, collaboratively going forward. And I'm going to finish just on acknowledging uh, my partners in clinical practice on the left and on the right-hand side, uh, the clinical fellows undertaking uh, PhD programs with me. Thank you very much.